Hello everyone and welcome to Archive Viking. Today is the second of two videos about the War of 1812. I chose to do two videos because both subjects covered, the Creek War and the War of 1812, are very complex subjects in and themselves and deserve designated videos in order to give them both justice. The, uh, the Creek War was a secondary war within the War of 1812 that saw very little, if any, actual British involvement, though the Creeks were, the, at least the Red Stick Creek faction of the Creek Nation were allied with the British. Today's video is going to be the War of 1812 itself, where we're going to go over in detail the conflict. So the War of 1812 was a second war between the United States and the British Empire. Often called the Second Revolution, um, <laughs> but it doesn't really fit that way uh, and it's often a considered a forgotten war uh, in fact it's not taught very much other than a few paragraphs oftentimes in schools however that you know not how it should be uh, the british uh, the war of 1812 shaped u.s history just as much as other conflicts such as the Mexican-American War, uh, the Civil War, and even the, well, especially just as much as the different uh, wars with the indigenous peoples of the Americas, especially considering many of these wars with the indigenous peoples of the Americas actually took place during the War of 1812. So what was uh, the backdrop of the War of 1812? Well, during this time, during the early 1800s, <laughs> the US, was beginning to expand uh, rapidly. First, it had gained the Mississippi Territory uh, and the Indiana Territory. The Indiana Territory, after the Northwest War against the Northwestern Confederacy, founded by Joseph Brandt, but uh, Joseph Brandt eventually had a falling out because he felt after Homer's defeat and St. Clair's defeat, the Northwest Confederacy should negotiate from a position of power before the U.S. overran them, while, while Blue Jacket, the Shawnee chief, uh, whom I called in my previous video Blue Duck, uh, which is my bad, and Little Turtle, uh, Miami chief, both leaders of the Confederacy, disagreed and wanted to continue the war. Eventually, Joseph Brandt was proven right, uh, and the U.S. overran the Northwest Confederacy as well as a, the U.S. participated in a war with the Cherokee and their confederation consisting of the Ch uh, Creek, Choctaw, Shawnee, uh, which was members of both the Northwest Confederacy and uh, the Cherokee Confederacy, and Lenape, also known as Delaware. And the Cherokee Confederacy was actually able to fight the U.S. to a draw. But the results of these wars were the uh, annexation of Indiana Territory and, Miss and Mississippi Territory. Furthermore, the U.S. began to purchase more land, um, especially the Louisiana Purchase, whom they purchased from Napoleon. But they didn't stop there. During the exploration of the Louisiana Purchase by the very famous Lewis and Clark expedition, the U.S. took it upon themselves to lay claim, like many other countries, to Oregon country. Oregon country, can, back then, consisted of uh, little bits of Northern California, modern-day Washington and Oregon, part, parts of uh, Colorado, Idaho, and Wyoming, as well as large tracts of what is now modern-day Canada. Um, the issue with them claiming it it was also claimed by a whole bunch of other countries, uh, especially Great Britain, Russia, and Spain. But that didn't you know, matter to the U.S. They were like, well, we're going to go ahead and claim it for our own. So the U.S. had been actually expanding uh, very rapidly. And in the case of the Louisiana Purchase, almost literally overnight doubled in size. Also during this time was a time of great turmoil. 
known as the Napoleonic Wars. This was a, a time of conflict that had not, a type of conflict that had not really been seen in Europe since the Thirty Years' War. There were larger conflicts most definitely fought that spanned the globe, or at least large chunks of the globe, like the War of Jenkins' Ear or the first true world war that the European powers uh, ever fought, the Seven Years' War, also known as the War of uh, the French and Indian War. But this is a war amount of warfare in the European region itself that had not been seen since the Thirty Years' War. Well, the slight difference of rather being rather than being uh, a group of alliances that were banding together and vying for power, like seen in the Thirty Years' War, uh, this is one universal conqueror going out and conquering all of the European states. That is Napoleon who rose to power after the French Revolution. Uh, and he was able to gain control of most of Europe through uh, conquests, such as uh, the conquest of the various Italian city-states, as well as the Germanic principalities, like the Kingdom of Prussia and the Confederation of the Rhine, as well as the Austrian Empire. But he was able to, also, to gain political alliances with Spain and other countries. But after this tsunami of a conquest, the only powers left standing uh, that weren't under some form of control by Napoleon were the Ottoman Empire, Russia, of course, he would eventually invade Russia. We all know how that went. <clears throat> Sweden, Britain, Portugal, and various other smaller states uh, to the south and around. For example, Wallachia and Moldavia, while being technically uh, different nations, were vassal states of the Ottoman Empire. But I digress. Anyways, the uh, Napoleonic Wars were actually having a great effect, unsurprisingly, on much of the Western world especially, well, not just, not especially, but also as well as the U.S. The U.S. was not uh, outside of this conflict. They were, they were still feeling it, even if they weren't participating in the wars, which actually made Britain mad. Britain wanted them to participate in the wars on their side, <laughs> and when the U.S. refused, Britain decided to stop any American uh, ships from entering any French ports, um, open firing on them, boarding them, and press ganging U.S. sailors into their service and such, which I'll cover more in more detail in a minute, uh, which greatly angered the U.S. So in response, President Jefferson created the Embargo Act, uh, Embargo Act uh, as seen by this cartoon where a turtle named Agrambe embargo <laughs> uh, is preventing people from trading. And is, essentially, this, what this was is he, pre he prevented any, he, he banned any European merchants from actually entering into U.S. ports, therefore causing a massive depression in the U.S. economy. And it was widely unpopular, hence the political cartoon you see here, uh, where uh, Agrambe, the turtle, is preventing people from trading. So combined with the depression that was caused and the how unpopular the act was, Thomas Jefferson repealed the act. But this was not the only issues that was going on. There were also, also various naval issues. Uh, the British, for example, were, would often uh, board U.S. ships and forcibly uh, take U.S. sailors and make them be British sailors for the cause of fighting in the Napoleonic Wars. And the British excuse for this is that anybody who was born during the British regime uh, and not born after the American Revolution were still considered British citizens. One such case was the Chesapeake Leopard Affair 
where the British warship, the Leopard, boarded the American ship, the Chesapeake, in search of supposedly British um, deserters, they start, British deserters. And they did find one. They, they found one British deserter, but the other three that they took were actually, <laughs> the other three sailors they took were actually American sailors whom they eventually forced into <laughs> service in the British Navy. Now, to be fair, as, as I just said, sometime, a lot of times there were actually British deserters on the ships that the British, American ships the British were board. But there were also a lot of American sailors who were, would be just simply press ganged into service of the British Navy. However, it wasn't just the British who were being the aggressors. <laughs> Oftentimes, U.S. ships would attack smaller British ships for a variety of reasons, such as in the Little Belt Affair, where a larger U.S. battleship sank a British merchant ship, killing 11 people. So there was a lot of tensions being caused on both sides <laughs> at sea. But that, you know, wasn't, those weren't really the main reasons. Um, the trade and the issues at sea were reasons that were uh, mentioned, but they weren't the really even the most important reasons or the most significant reasons the war started. One of the most significant was the uh, U.S. wanting to gain control of Canada. And many in the U.S. felt um, that if they invaded Canada in force, the citizens of Canada would welcome them as heroes and help them overthrow British rule in Canada. This, this we'll talk about later in the video. This would not actually go that way, but that was the idea. And it was, of course, the idea that, uh, well, Manifest Destiny hadn't been labeled yet, but it had always been around. This is essentially what this was. It was Manifest Destiny constantly trying to expand U.S. territories. And Canada was, of course, one of those targets. But <clears throat> by far the most, the, the largest cause um, based off of examination of the, of the documents was that the British were arming various tri uh, American Indian tribes uh, in the, uh, on the continent of North America, such as the Shawnee. In fact, the Northwestern Confederacy uh, that had formed in the Northwest Territory in order to fight the U.S. Uh, were uh, armed by the British, as well as the Cherokee Confederation in the South, which allowed them both to better fight the expansion of the U.S. Um, and this eventually led rise to these individuals down here, Tecumseh and Tisquatawa, or the Prophet. <clears throat> Tisquatawa was a Shawnee, and they were both Shawnee, and this was, Tisquatawa was a Shawnee individual who, after uh, supposedly having a vision from the Great Spirit, began a massive religious movement to unite the various tribes and drive out the Americans and the British. And he was very anti-European styles. He was anti-interracial uh, marriage between any uh, American Indians and Europeans. He was against any European clothings or trappings, etc. And he began to gather a large amount of followers behind him, <laughs> culminating in a, a large city called Prophetstown that I will get to talk about it in a minute but uh he wasn't alone there was also his brother tecumseh tecumseh whom i was originally going to do a separate video about but you know about tecumseh's war but tecumseh's war is the war of 1812 uh, so he cannot be separated from it <clears throat> but tecumseh was a renowned shawnee warrior who had fought under uh, Blue Jacket and Little Turtle, as well as fought alongside 
the Cherokee war chiefs Dragon Canoe and John Watts, who led the Cherokee Confederation during the Northwest War and the Cherokee American Wars. And during this time, he had gained notoriety for being a skilled and brave warrior. Uh, also during this time, he learned from the three individuals, Blue Jacket, Little Turtle, uh, sorry, four individuals, Little Turtle, Dragon, uh, Dragon Canoe, and John Watts about ideas of pan-Indian alliances, which had been ideas that had been thrown around by various tribes over the course of about 50 years before now, and which is, which is what led to the formation of the uh, Cherokee Confederacy uh, in the South, the South Confederacy um, of Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Lenape, and Shawnee, and the Northwest Confederacy consisting of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, the Lenape, the Shawnee, Illinois, Wabash, etc. And of course, when these wars ended uh, with the Cherokee American War ending in a draw and the Northwestern War ending in a defeat for the Nor Northwest Confederacy, Tecumseh was sort of left to pick up the pieces. And he never forgot about the idea of a Pan-Indian Alliance. In fact, he eventually decided that was much like others had, it was the only way to ever drive out European powers. And he wanted a true Pan-Indian alliance. He wanted an alliance that stretched from the Great Lakes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and as far east and west as he could have it. <clears throat> and he did actually begin to uh, perform this. After his brother began to gather a following, Tecumseh decided now was the time. And he began traveling through the Northwest and began gathering various tribes to his cause, eventually resulting in the uh, tribe, a confederation consisting of the Delawares. By the way, right here, right here it says Lenape and Delawares as two separate tribes. They're one tribe. I don't know why they mentioned that. Anyways, <clears throat> the Delawares, the Ojibwe, the Wyandots, the Fox, the Sauk, also known as the Sac tribe, the Odawas, Kickapoos, Miami, Seneca, Onondaga, and of course Shawnee, as well as the Potawatomi um, tribes, and eventually even the, um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And with this confederacy, he carved out a fairly large area for it, uh, resulting in the construction of, uh, alongside his brother Shinsquatawa, of Prophetstown, named after his brother the Prophet. And it became a large city-state of sorts that was multi-ethnic, having multiple tribes, several large tribes, uh, staying with it, eventually becoming sort of the beacon and the symbol of Tecumseh's and Tenskwatawa's Pan-Indian Alliance. Unfortunately, the Pan-Indian Alliance, well, sorry, unsurprisingly, not unfortunately, unsurprisingly, the Pan-Indian Alliance would eventually come into conflict with the U.S., specifically the governor of the Illinois Territory, William Henry Harrison, who would eventually run for president in the 1840s. <laughs> And the issue at hand was the signing away of two tracts of land that you see here in pink uh, at the Treaty of Fort Wayne, which is heavily angered Tecumseh, especially considering it was members of his own tribe, the Shawnee, who had sold it. Um, so furious, he stormed into uh, the fort that William Henry Harrison and his garrison were headquartered at and had a huge argument between William Henry Harrison and himself uh, before eventually leaving the fort hating each other even more. Eventually, Tecumseh would decide it was time to go to the southeastern region <clears throat> and try to convince the southeastern tribes to join his confederacy as well. Of course, as we meant, as I mentioned in my previous video, the Creek War, which I'll link in the I card, this came a lot. It came out with a lot of mixed results um, that we'll discuss later. Uh, anyways, while he was gone, 
William Henry Harrison, realizing that the primary leader of the Confederacy was away, decided now was time to strike. Uh, so in 1811, he amassed his forces and began marching to Prophetstown. And what had happened is, before Tecumseh had left, he had told his brother and the various other sub-leaders of the Confederacy, don't attack the U.S. until the Confederacy is large enough to win a prolonged war. However, when William Henry Harrison was approaching, the prophet supposedly had another vision from the Great Spirit and said that if they attacked at night, they would win. What since Quatwa didn't know is William Henry Harrison had learned from the mistakes of previous U.S. generals and commanders, specifically from Hjalmar's defeat and St. Clair's defeat in the Northwest Indian War, and had uh, ordered his men to sleep with their guns loaded and the bayonets already affixed to the muskets as well as having ordered a several sentries around the camp to watch out for approaching war parties. So when the war party of Prophetstown was approaching, some of the sentries were able actually to see them despite the war party uh, trying to sneak around and open fire alerting the rest of William Henry Harrison's camp uh, and starting the Battle of Tippecanoe that resulted in defeat of the war party at Prophetstown, which then proceeded to return to Prophetstown and uh, all the leaders were furious at Tenskwatawa for tricking them, essentially in their eyes. So, that, so much so that by the time William Henry Harrison actually got to Prophetstown, all the various parties had abandoned Prophetstown and Tin Squatwa would sort of disappear into obscurity. Uh, however, this would not be the end of Tecumseh's Confederacy, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. In the US, there was uh, also political strife. Uh, surprisingly, there were two uh, parties, the Federalist Party uh, and the Republican Party, but especially during this time, there were the there was the anti-war party and the war hawks, the people who said we should go to war. The anti-war party consisted of people such as Timothy Pitkin, which is the individual you see here in the bottom, while the war hawk party consisted of people uh, such as Henry Clay, whom you see here in the bottom left. And eventually, the war hawks won out. The war hawks were able to win the day and war with England was shortly declared. Uh, this was done in conjunction with uh, President James Madison, who sent a declaration of war to England, uh, who, had already, who had already sort of repealed the trade sanctions uh, and the acts of attacking U.S. ships who were entering French harbors. However, receiving the declaration of war, they were like, fine, we'll go to war with you. Uh, they didn't really care that much, but they still did, and resulting in the Battle of Round Island, which was uh, a victory for the British. <clears throat> so, as a result of the beginning of this war, the U.S. Uh, appointed General William Hull as the commander of, the, of an expedition force to invade Canada. It should be noted at this point in time that Britain had not even committed even half of their forces to this war front because to, in their eyes, the Napoleonic Wars were the bigger threat. But needless to say, they still went to war. And William Hull marched into Canada and was able to take various cities uh, and forts such as uh, Fort George, Fort Erie and Fort York and such. However, <laughs> this is where he found that the idea that they would be greeted as saviors was actually wrong. The, no, most Canadians uh, who were so, uh, Canadian subjects to Britain who did not welcome them. In fact, they fought against the U.S., leading 
William Hall to being forced to retreat to the U.S. Fort of Detroit. So in response to this invasion, the British appointed Major General Isaac Brock as the supreme commander of the British forces who were stationed in Canada. Again, most of the British forces were actually in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and it was during this time that he took it upon himself to ally with Tecumseh, whom Tecumseh did not have any love for Br the British at all. However, he understood that in order for his Confederacy to win, he has to go, he had to pick the lesser evil. And upon meeting Isaac Brock and seeing Isaac Brock's bravery in battle uh, and his courage, they formed a fast friendship. In fact, upon seeing this courage, it, it's uh, reported that Tecumseh said, now this is a man. Whether or not that actually happened, but anyways. And they formed a very quick friendship. And together, they were able to successfully attack and lay siege to Detroit. They had actually less numbers than the U.S. forces in Detroit, but they used various what, uh, forms of uh, psychological warfare and deception. For example, Tecumseh ordering his forces to <laughs> move in and out of the forest at intervals uh, that was on the edge, the forest that was on the edge of Fort Detroit to make it look like there was actually more uh, warriors there than there was. So with the psychological warfare, eventually William Hall was defeated and was forced to surrender uh, Fort Detroit to Isaac Brock and Tecumseh, where he then returned to the U.S. territory and was uh, reprimanded and, I believe, stripped of his rank. The uh, Tecumseh and his and uh, Isaac Brock's alliance was also able to win uh, the Battle of Fort Deerhorn, where they defeated <laughs> 50 U.S. soldiers. Uh, though most of the inhabitants of the fort consisted of uh, civilians, especially women and children. As a result of this knowledge, Isaac Brock and Tecumseh allowed the inhabitants of the fort to go free, so long as they returned immediately to the uh, to U.S. territory. However, despite being set free, 500 uh, Potawatomi would attack the evacuees, killing over 60 of them while only losing 15. And this would be one of a couple of events that would make Tecumseh furious. Because Tecumseh, while he was a warrior and he was not averse to uh, attacking an opponent twice, you know, defeating them in battle and then attacking them later in another battle and such, he hated needless bloodshed. He, he hated massacres of people who were not armed or were defenseless. So this immediately infuriated him. Uh, in response to this, <clears throat> eventually the, uh, the U.S. would march into British territory and take the city, uh, well, the town of Queenston resulting in Isaac Brock and Tecumseh mar uh, marching to retake Queenston, uh, what became known as the Battle of Queenston Heights, which they, they did win. They retook Queenston, however, at the cost of Isaac Brock himself. The issue was Isaac Brock uh, had a tendency of fighting on the front lines with his own men, which is a tactic that can bring a lot of higher high morale for the men, for U.S. soldiers, uh, for any soldiers. The issue was, is he was wearing a, a brightly colored sash that had been gifted to him by Tecumseh, and so it made him an immediately easy target for U.S. sharpshooters to kill, and he was shot through the chest and died. But again, not without the British actually retaking Winston Heights from the U.S. In response to Isaac Brock's death, General Henry Proctor was chosen as his replacement. However, Henry Proctor did not 
have a very good relationship with Tecumseh at all. And he was not the um, skilled commander that Isaac Brock was. However, despite this, uh, the British and uh, allied Indian forces under Proctor and Tecumseh were able to defeat William Henry Harrison in several battles, uh, especially the Battle of Frenchtown, where uh, after this battle, Isaac Brock and Tecumseh allowed William Henry Harrison to return to U.S. territory. However, uh, Potawatomi forces again found um, U.S. forces uh, on the way and massacred them. Again, greatly angering Tecumseh, who for the rest of this, uh, for the rest of the war, uh, for the rest of his time in the war, would stop uh, with all of his power any kind of massacre possible. He, anytime somebody thought about it, he stopped it. Uh, at least if it was within, within his own confederacy, which is uh, one of the reasons why uh, to this day in both Canada and the U.S., despite being uh, an enemy of the U.S., Tecumseh is a folk hero. Uh, after the Battle of Frenchtown, as well as the battles of Brownstown and uh, Mugwaga, etc., uh, Henry Proctor attempted to lay siege to Fort Meigs where him, William Henry Harrison was um, holed up. He was, he was stationed there uh, and ready to withstand the siege, which he did. I, Henry Proctor and Tecumseh were unable to complete the siege of Fort Meigs and were forced to withdraw back to British territory. Furthermore, a U.S. naval battle happened uh, in the Battle of Quinton Bay, which gave, made Lake Erie, gave Lake Erie uh, as uh, U.S. territory, practically undoing all of the gains uh, from the victories of Eisenbrock, uh, Isaac Brock and Tecumseh and leaving Detroit vulnerable and eventually Detroit would be retaken by the U.S. Uh, after this, William Henry Harrison would eventually uh, go on the offensive and through uh, after chasing Tecumseh and I and um, Henry Proctor for some time, was able to eventually corner them at the River Thames, resulting in the Battle of Thames. During this battle, due to bad morale um, and maybe some dislike uh, dislike of Tecumseh himself, Henry Proctor <laughs> retreated and completely abandoned Tecumseh and his Confederacy. However, Tecumseh and his Confederacy refused to retreat. They decided they were going to fight to the man. And they fought valiantly and viciously against Harrison's forces. Uh, however, eventually, uh, a American sharpshooter was able to pick out who was Tecumseh and shot him through the chest. And with Tecumseh's death, this was the and for the most part of his confederacy. However, as I'll talk about in a minute, other elements of his confederacy would continue to fight throughout the war, thus ending with the Battle of River Thames and a U.S. victory and the death of Tecumseh. It was concurrent with this was a British campaign into the Niagara frontier, where they began to win a variety of battles, such as uh, they began to win a variety of battles alongside the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, had decided to enter, enter the war on the side of the British. And together, they were able, able to capture Fort Niagara uh, from US forces, as well as burn uh, actually burn Buffalo, New York. Furthermore, they were able to uh, repel U.S. attacks uh, at the Battle of uh, Chattaguay. I may have butchered that a little bit. Gaining another uh, victory for the British and Indian Alliance. 
Despite these victories, however, uh, this was also a campaign where several key victories for the U.S. happened. First, uh, the Battle of Chippewa happened where a general named Winfield Scott had subjected his men to uh, very intense drilling procedures and various other things in order to have the U.S. militia and U.S. regular army better trained. As before this, the U.S. Army and militia had been very poorly trained, and this allowed him to win the Battle of Chippewa. However, um, the U.S. also eventually lost the Battle of Niagara Falls and forced, Scott, and forced uh, Winfield Scott to retreat back to U.S. territory. But the U.S. was also able to uh, successfully defend uh, for Erie from uh, a British siege, winning the siege of Fort Erie. As well as the U.S. winning several key naval battles on Lake Champlain, gaining control of Lake Champlain, though this would be really the only gains in the northern front that the U.S. would uh, have. Furthermore, in what was known as the, Miss, is the Missouri Territory as well as the Illinois Territory, uh, the various remnants of Tecumseh's Confederacy were gaining very uh, several big key victories. They were led by Black Hawk, a Sauk war band leader or Sauk war chief, um, and under his leadership, the Kickapoo, the Sauk, and Fox tribes allied with the U.S., uh, not U.S., but the British, and pushed into Missouri and Illinois territory and won uh, several very key battles, such as the Battle of Rock Island Rapids, the Battle of Sinkhole, uh, the Battle of Credit Island, and uh, the Battle of Mackinac Island as well, completely uh, taking control of Missouri and Illinois territory for the most part. Uh, however, of course, eventually, at the end of the war, Britain would return it to the U.S., but despite that, the uh, Second Fox tribe and the Kickapoo would continue to wage war with the, uh, with the U.S. government well into 18, the 1817s. So they would not stop fighting uh, even after the war ended. So <clears throat> while all of this was happening, the British uh, appointed a Admiral Cockburn uh, as the supreme commander of the British fleet that was battling uh, the U.S., which the British fleet was a massive fleet consisting of around 500 ships, uh, which is a Herculean amount of ships. The U.S. had I, I had nowhere near that amount. They had been trying to build a fleet. Uh, but were unable to build a fleet that size and time. And so Admiral Cockburn uh, proceeded to uh, install a blockade, a semi-type blockade as it was described, uh, around the all U.S. ports and going all, all U.S. ports on the Atlantic coast and all U.S. ports on the Gulf coast, using Port Royal and Jamaica uh, as his base and a staging ground for further campaigns on the U.S. However, it should also be noted that the U.S. did fare decently well in naval battles, uh, and this was for a variety of reasons. Um, specifically, the U.S. chose only to engage British ships on their terms. Uh, they often avoided British ships and would prefer to choose to attack smaller British ships as well as British merchant vessels that were not as heavily defended. And this is where you get battles where uh, you hear about American soldiers going, I have not yet begun to fight. However, it should also be noted that <laughs> the British won quite a few battles uh, at sea as well especially if they were able to close the, the gap 
and have bore it and get close enough to the U.S. ships in order for the uh, elite British Marines to board the U.S. ships. So they British actually won quite a few battles here as well. One important and very forgotten uh, effect of the War of 1812, in fact, uh, an event that I was unaware of until I did research for this video, and I'm very happy that I learned it, was the large-scale emancipation of enslaved Africans. So, because of the strife and conflict happening in the War of 1812, over 4,000 enslaved Africans took it upon themselves to escape to Canada uh, as refugees and gain their freedom. One of these individuals was Gabriel Hall. And this makes sense. Well, I wouldn't want to be uh, enslaved either. And when you have a war going on where people are distracted by fighting a major superpower, why not make for your freedom? But it wasn't just that. Uh, several U.S. generals, much like they had in the Revolutionary War, made an offer to uh, enslaved Africans that if they enlisted in help and helped in the fight, they would gain their freedom. This didn't always happen, but that was still viewed as an avenue for freedom by many enslaved Africans. Despite this, uh, the most uh, effective way of, uh, other than fleeing to Canada, way of emancipation for enslaved Africans was actually the proclamation of Alexander Cochrane. Alexander Cochrane made a proclamation that any who, uh, any U.S. citizens who wanted to defect could. Now, of course, this didn't explicitly state enslaved Africans, but it very much was implied. And so as a result, Cochrane relocated 2,400, that's right, 2,400 enslaved Africans to British territory, such as the dockyard at Bermuda, and granted them their freedom and allowed them to enlist in the British military, where especially two brigades, uh, two corps, um, known as the Corps of Colonial Marines, where they were uh, distinguished by their, designated by their white uniforms rather than their red and white uniform. And in fact, many of these colonial marines from the two colonial marine brigades actually participated in the Chesapeake campaign that we'll talk about shortly, specifically the Battle of Bladensburg, gaining several key victories for the British. As a result of this uh, service, after the War of 1812, the British relocated uh, and settled the, uh, these companies in the British colony of Trinidad, again, granting them their freedom. And it was during this time that the uh, so-called Americans would intermarry with the indigenous peoples of the region and create their own uni uh, unique community, uh, community that is still in existence to this day, as you see here. However, Again, this was not the only, these were not the only avenues. The enslaved Africans would often escape to Florida, as Spain had already abolished slavery. In fact, Florida had always been sort of a avenue to go to anyway, as far back as the 1730s, at least. There's even a fort in Florida called Fort Jose, which is the oldest free black community in the history of uh, the Americas. So, of course, the enslaved Africans would also make their way to Spanish Florida, forming maroon, what are called maroon communities or runaway slave communities, but also they would flee to the various uh, American Indian tribes, the various First Nations peoples, as they were often uh, immediately welcomed and inducted into the tribe, or at least, you know, inducted into the tribe after a short amount of time. By far, the Seminole territory was the uh, territory that most would flee to, but they would flee to other territories. But the Seminole territory is important because 
it was a already confederation of various different tribes, such as the Appalachian, as well as the Timucua and the Wali, who had fled from Georgia to here. And so it was already a, a multi-ethnic um, confederacy by the time enslaved Africans came there. So they just helped, they increased the ethnogenesis of the Seminole tribe by fleeing from their enslaved, uh, from their plantations into Seminole territory. Uh, with the Seminole tribe eventually making its full ethnogenesis after the Creek War. So, with that in mind, it's important to note that this emancipation of slaves during the War of 1812 was actually the second largest emancipation of slaves in the history of the U.S., with the, with the largest being um, the Civil War. So, I, which is it, which I personally think is a travesty that this is not known. I feel like this should be taught. So because of the War of 1812, enslaved thousands of enslaved Africans, around 6,000 or more, were able to gain their freedom. However, um, we must get back to the war and <clears throat> as the war began to progress, uh, progress, the British eventually began to make even more victories. Uh, they occupied Maine, you know, taking control of uh, areas around Castine and uh, Machias, uh, Eastport and St. Andrews and such, uh, actually led by Admiral Cockburn himself, uh, gaining a foothold that would allow uh, British forces to perform further campaigns. One such individual was Robert Ross. So you see, at this point in time, <laughs> the British had at least temporarily defeated Napoleon and exiled him to the island of Elba. This allowed Britain to finally, uh, which says a lot, uh, they were able to gain victory, a lot of victories before this, finally able to commit the majority of their forces to the War of 1812. And they uh, appointed Robert Ross, General Robert Ross, as the commander, and he began what was known as the Chesapeake Campaign. He landed in Maryland and marched down, defeating the U.S. in various battles before eventually getting to Washington, D.C. itself, defeating the U.S. forces there, and burning down much of, not all of, but much of Washington, D.C., uh, including the White House that you see here. Afterwards, they marched uh, out of Washington, D.C. and won several uh, other key battles. However, um, as they began to lay siege to the city of Baltimore, they were repulsed. Um, and it was a hard-fought battle. It was not an easy loss. But because of how hard the U.S. fought, one U.S. prisoner, uh, uh, Francis Key Scott, uh, on a British ship, was able to write this, what we now know as the National Anthem and the Star Spangled Banner. And, you know, the story goes that supposedly after hours and hours of fighting, he looked out with his little scope uh, from the ship and saw the American flag still flying on the fort and knew that the U.S. was still winning. Whether or not that actually is true, it's up for debate, but that's the story that he told. So now we will move on to the Southern Campaign. So I already did a previous video on the Creek War that I'll link, again, we'll link in the iCard. However, uh, it's important that we do cover it a little bit. So the Creek War was an event uh, as a result of Tecumseh's formation of his Confederacy. He came to the Southeast and began uh, trying to recruit the five tribes of the Southeast, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and Seminole into his alliance. However, the most of the five tribes did not agree and uh, sided with the U.S. However, half of the Creek Nation, that would eventually become known as the Red Sticks, named for their Red War Clubs, would side with Tecumseh and the British, starting the Creek War. As a result, the Cherokee, uh, Choctaw, and the other half of the Creek Nation, the White Sticks, would uh, side with the U.S. 
and form an expeditionary force led by Major General Andrew Jackson, who together with uh, the Cherokee and the Choctaw Creek would win several key battles. As I said in the uh, Creek War video, actually most of the battles were won by the Cherokee uh, and Choctaw allies, though several battles were also won by the Tennessee and militia led by Andrew Jackson. And eventually they were able to corner and defeat the Resistant Creeks at Horseshoe Bend. Concurrent with this, uh, U.S. forces laid siege to and took Fort Boyer, uh, allowing for the eventual defense of New Orleans. After the defeat of the Creeks, however, Andrew Jackson took it upon himself to take his allied forces and his Tennessee militia into Florida, which had... Um, despite being under Spanish control, had allowed, Spain had allowed Britain to station U.S. forces, uh, sorry, U.S. forces, British forces in Pensacola and Mobile. Uh, so Andrew Jackson marched into Florida and defeated the British at Pensacola and completely drove the British out of Florida where he then proceeded to make his way for New Orleans because he knew that the next target of the uh, British assault would be New Orleans. And he began to immediately fortify the defenses as this was a very key port for the US. However, at this point in time, he didn't have necessarily enough men to defend it. So he called upon several allies. First, he called upon uh, the Choctaw. He also called them on the Cherokee and the Creek, but they weren't able to get there in time. Uh, so the primary Indian allies in this battle were the Choctaw, led by uh, Mushalat. Um, I hope I pronounced that right. And the Choctaw were watching. You feel free to correct me. <clears throat> and Pushmahata, who had been uh, an opponent of Tecumseh. And they brought several hundred Choctaw warriors with them uh, on this campaign. Though, to be fair, only a couple hundred themselves participated in the Battle of New Orleans itself, uh, as opposed to most of the campaign through Louisiana, uh, but they did provide key support. The most uh, important support, on the other hand, uh, just other than the Choctaw support, which was very key, was actually an individual known as Jean Lafitte, who was a French privateer. Well, maybe privateer. He actually, <laughs> he, he was actually probably a pirate, but he called himself a privateer or a pirate for hire. And he may have actually been a little bit, a little bit of both. He also served as a smuggler. Um, and he had actually been approached by the British as well. The British came and said, offered him money as often European and other uh, major world powers would do with privateers. Uh, in fact, the US used privateers to great effect in the Atlantic front uh, to raid other merchant ships <clears throat> and the British offered him uh, an exorbitant amount of money to side with them and help them lay siege to New Orleans. What they weren't aware of <laughs> is Andrew Jackson offered double the money to Jean Lafitte and also offered Jean Lafitte and all of his men a full pardon. Um, of course Andrew Jackson didn't really have the authority to give that pardon Mm, but whatever. Uh, and so as a result of this, Jean Lafitte sided with the U.S. And he brought all of his men and his several his fleet of several ships. Um, I'm not sure how many ships he had, but he did have enough to provide a defense for the port, um, as well as stationing many of his men, most of his men in artillery units for Andrew Jackson, though a few would also be put into the militia as reinforcements for the militia. And then eventually, the British would actually lay siege to New Orleans. Uh, however, they would face a lot of difficulty. And one of the reasons for this was Jean Lafitte actually suggested uh, to Andrew Jackson that they have some of their defensive lines around swampy areas to make it difficult for, one, the British to move, but also the British to move their artillery through, a, a suggestion that Andrew Jackson took. 
So uh, with that, the British began to have difficulties, but did lay siege to New Orleans. And it was a hard fought battle. The British would uh, often charge in with numbers um, and were able to gain several key minor victories in the battle. However, they did eventually lose. Now, there are a couple of explanations for this. Um, of course, the Tennessee militia uh, and Georgia militia like to claim that it was us. We laid down a hell of gunfire and cut the British to shreds. However, there are two other uh, accounts that we can come to. The U.S. regular army that was also stationed in the artillery with Jean Lafitte and the British, and both the re U.S. regulars and the British describe the uh, artillery manned by Jean Lafitte's pirates, and of course, and again, the U.S. regulars, there were some U.S. regular soldiers, professional soldiers, um, as the biggest cause for their defeat, because the artillery units would cause, would have uh, a, would put a massive crossfire on the British and just tear the British lines to shreds before they even got to the militia, uh, the interjections of militia. So we have one account from militia claiming that it was them and two accounts from the British and the U.S. professional soldiers from, you know, the U.S. regulars who said that it was actually Jean Lafitte's cannons that did the job. Of course, Andrew Jackson would eventually take all the credit for himself, much like the Tennesseans did, but it is important to note that the battle probably would not have been won if not for Jean Lafitte's, uh, one, his pirates that he provided, uh, the artillery that he provided, and also the fleet he provided to help defend the port. Uh, but this was not necessarily the be all and all of uh, the war. In fact, in response to this, British General John Lambert proceeded to lay siege to Fort Boyer and retake it from the U.S. Uh, in preparation to attack Mobile. And this was done concurrently with uh, Admiral Cockburn himself, who launched a campaign uh, on what is now modern-day Kenyon County, Georgia, taking various forts as well as Cumberland Island uh, and St. Mary's, Georgia, in preparation for another attack on the U.S. forts in the southeast. However, <laughs> despite these gains for both Andrew Jackson and uh, for Andrew Jackson, John Lambert, and Admiral Cockburn, the Treaty of Ghent had been signed ending the War of 1812. Uh, um, fortunately for the end of the war, the letters did not reach these three individuals in time, or at least that's what they claimed. Maybe they reached them and they decided to do it anyway. We don't know, but the Treaty of Ghent was signed, and it was signed as a, <clears throat> and I quote, a status quo antebellum, or essentially the borders would return to how they were beforehand, and it was a quote-unquote draw, or at least in the eyes of the U.S., it was a draw. When you look at uh, all the battles, as I've described here, the British and uh, their American Indian allies won uh, most battles in the north, uh, in the northwest and the northeast. Uh, the British won a lot of key battles in the southeast. They were able to successfully blockade the much of the U.S. ports, um, and were also able to march into the capital of the U.S. and burn it to the ground, as well as defeating several other key U.S. forces in the Chesapeake campaign. In fact, the only real gains the U.S. had won was the battles of Lake Erie and Lake Champlain and the Creek War, as well as a little, of course, the Pensacola, but that was still technically part of the Creek War. Um, as well as a few battles at sea, but by and large, most of the battles were actually won by Britain. Well, sort of. I did take the time to find all the known battles of War of 1812 and count them, and it was relatively even in terms of victory. But when you look at, say, for example, the, uh, the American Revolution, where actually 
the Continental Army and the U.S. Army lost most of the battles, yet still won the war, the amount of battles won is not what's important. What is important is the quality of the victories and how strategic they were. And by and large, the British won most strategic victories. They gained all of the Illinois territory, all of Missouri territory. Um, they decimated the uh, capital and the command of the U.S. military. They hampered U.S. fleet movements, uh, and despite losing some naval battles, were able still to perform very well at sea, as well as captured several key forts in the southeast. So, looking at it all together, in my opinion, those some viewers may disagree, but in my opinion, it was actually a British victory, and the U.S. was claiming it was a draw sort of like the Black Knight from Monty Python was like, all right, we'll call it a draw after he's already lost all his arms and legs. But that being said, the war did end. Now, uh, with that, we need to sort of, you know, we are left with the question, what were the overall effects of the War of 1812? Were they um, significant? Were they minor? What? Well, for one thing, uh, as a direct result of the War of 1812 and his uh, experiences in Pensacola, Andrew Jackson convinced the U.S. that Florida, uh, Spain's hold of Florida was weak, as well as raids from the Seminole uh, being a factor. And so Andrew Jackson and his uh, made another alliance with the Cherokee and Choctaws uh, and marched into Florida, as well as some Creeks as well. I uh, marched into Florida and defeated the Seminoles, as well as defeated the Spanish, taking uh, the Pensacola, taking Pensacola again, St. Mark's, and Sewanee, and then defeating the Seminole in the first Seminole War. This resulted in the uh, Adams Onus Treaty, uh, in which Spain ceded uh, the, all of Florida. Um, the last little bit of southern Alabama that the U.S. didn't hold, the last little bit of southern Mississippi that the U.S. didn't hold, and the only part of Louisiana the U.S. didn't hold, as well as making the 42nd uh, parallel, I believe is what it's called, the boundary between the U.S. and Spain. So was that the only uh, effect of the War of 1812? No, not by a long shot. In fact, uh, the War of 1812 and the U.S. is, well, you know my opinion on that already, but in the eyes of the U.S., uh, how well they did in the War of 1812 led to what was called the Era of Good Feelings, which was a time of um, large peace, of, of world peace. There was not many conflicts actually happening, especially for the U.S., and it was a rise of nationalism um, and uh, national pride. And it would eventually be what uh, would help propel individuals like Andrew Jackson into political office, with Andrew Jackson eventually being elected as president during this time. But what about Britain? What, what was, what, how did Britain view it? So, well, Britain... <laughs> <laughs> actually didn't really care that much for again britain won most of the engaged most of the important engagements and won the most tactical victories and such and won the war at least in mine and a few other historians eyes uh, and to them it was really only a sideshow to the more important napoleonic wars after all until the chesapeake campaign the british didn't even commit they may have committed, you know, a third of their forces. They didn't commit uh, all of their forces or even half of their forces until after Napoleon had been exiled to Elba. So to them, it was really just inconsequential sideshow. I mean, after all, they had accomplished all their goals. They weren't out for conquest. They were just out to sort of punish the U.S. And that they did. They most definitely did that <laughs> by a lot. And so to them, it was really not important. What was important, again, was the Napoleonic Wars, especially considering Napoleon had escaped Elba and reignited the Napoleonic Wars. Of course, he would eventually be defeated at Waterloo permanently, 
but to the British, this was still the much larger threat and America was inconsequential. Canada, however, had a different view. Their experiences with the US invasions of Canadian territory led them to build several forts that you see here uh, on their border. One such fort, which is this one, the Quebec Citadel. And this was to strengthen the Canadian border to prevent any further US incursions, which of course the US never invaded Canada again, um, probably because they didn't really care that much, but also probably because of these forts. These were heavily defended forts. Star forts are actually incredibly difficult to lay siege to uh, because one, these forts are narrow, like they're low to the ground to a point, but they're also sloped. Uh, and these large areas in between the star shape um, allow for a large area of crossfire on besiegers. So, Basically, Canada had made itself a very difficult opponent to invade. An opponent that, sure, if the US committed enough forces, probably could invade um, and, and take, but would not necessarily would be able to hold it. So, by far, the largest effect of the War of 1812 was the effect it had on the indigenous peoples of the Americas, the American Indians, First Nations peoples. One, uh, the five tribes of the Southeast uh, felt after the War of 1812, after seeing the Creek War and Tecumseh's War, they felt, as well as the end, after as well as seeing the effects of the Cherokee American War, which again was by and large a draw, and the Northwestern War against the Northwestern Confederacy being a loss they felt it was time to modernize, oh, sorry, let me rephrase that, not modernize, to assimilate. They felt it was time to assimilate into American culture with the hopes that they would not be removed or exterminated. Of course, it was never about how American or European they looked. It was always about racism. Um, one of the mentioned reasons for removing the Cherokee, for example, was finding gold in Georgia. But again, it was never about that. It was always about racism. That being said, the assimilation policy and the, um, I'm gonna use this term, I, I want this, to make this clear to any uh, uh, Native Americans who are watching. I'm just using this term very, 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 very subjectively. <clears throat> they began to civilize themselves or at least civilized in the eyes of American and, Euro and European powers because civilized, they were already civilized. They already had city, large cities and towns themselves. And in the case of like Sequoia and um, this Muscogee Creek here, their clothing and garb, as well as Osceola, uh, Osceola here, their clothing and garb wasn't that different from European clothing already. <clears throat> But anyways, uh, and they began to build European style cities like New Echota, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. And uh, in the case of Sequoia, who, as I spoke about in the Creek War video, after witnessing uh, what having, uh, not having a writing uh, system, or at least a writing system that you could uh, send a, in, say, a letter, because the southeastern tribes did have writing systems in the form of petroglyphs and other symbols, but they were often carved on rocks and caves and etc. and were for religious, uh, to my understanding, religious uses. <clears throat> so the Sequoia uh, created uh, the things like the Cherokee syllabary and writing system, and I believe they were copied by the other southeastern tribes. Unfortunately, Despite these attempts to assimilate and despite these quote unquote in the eyes of the Americans, again, the, this is still subjective and they were modern in, in every sense of the word before this, modernize uh, in the eyes of the US, the Indian Removal Act um, under Andrew Jackson did come to fruition. Now, to be fair, Indian removal had actually been originally proposed by Thomas Jefferson as early as I think 1804 and had been recycled over and over again um, 
twice by Andrew Jackson. Uh, again, I talk about it the first time we tried it in the Creek War video. Uh, but eventually, in the 1830s, it actually began to stick. And that's because Andrew Jackson and his party gained a ridiculous amount of power. And despite the it being a contentious bill, uh, the vote in the House of Repre Representatives, for example, being uh believe 107 to, uh, like 102 to 97 uh it did eventually pass and would result in five different uh forced removals uh, of all five tribes where they were forced to trek uh in terrible conditions all the way to oklahoma and there's a reason that the all all five of these trails would become known as trail of tears or trails of sadness or what have you resulting in thousands of deaths. Uh, for example, 4,000 Cherokee died alone on their trails of fear, on their trail of tears. And that's not counting the other ones, such as the Chicksaw and Choctaw and similar and such. Though it should be fair that um, the uh, Chickasaw, <laughs> despite their uh, setbacks, upon hearing about the, uh, the Irish potato famine, uh, it was I, well. I forget if it was the uh, Chickasaw or Choctaw. Uh, it was one of these tribes, one of these two tribes. But they heard about the Irish potato famine, and still gathered a, together a bunch of money and sent it to Ireland to help uh, <laughs> um, stop this famine. Something that Ireland to this day has remembered and is are still ardent supporters of uh, these tribes. <clears throat> I'm gonna. Because again, I unfortunately I apologize to uh, whether it be the Chicksaw or the Choctaw, whoever's watching, please remind me. I am so sorry for forgetting. But uh, these two tribes, whichever tribe of this did this, they are still uh, allies to Ireland to this day. <clears throat> uh, and of course, eventually, as a result of the, of this Indian removal, there would be several wars: uh, the Second Seminole War, the Second Creek War. Black Hawk's War up here um, around the Missouri and Ohio territory, and as a result of it, uh, a symptom of it, the Texas Cherokee War, uh, resulting in the loss of all this lands uh, to, you know, the loss of all indigenous people's lands to the U.S. and opening up the U.S., uh, sorry, the Southeast to cotton farming. In fact, that Andrew Jackson had noted how fertile the South around Mississippi and New Orleans and Alabama and such was, and it was one of his plans to open it up to cotton farming. And this is what eventually led to the massive uh, plantation system in the Southeast. So uh, that, again, by and large, the most affected by the uh, events of the War of 1812 were the indigenous peoples of the Americas, unfortunately. So with that, that ends the video. Um, I'm sorry it's not ending on a more positive note, but there's not much I can do about that. Um, but it, you, you can see why the War of 1812 is important for the history of the U.S. I mean, it's, it's considered a forgotten war, but it shaped the U.S. in such a profound way. I mean, let me put it this way. If, you, if you're not going to remember the uh, War of 1812 for its effect on, say, Canada or the U.S. or Britain, you at least, at the very least, need to remember it for the effects it had on, one, the emancipation of slaves, again, the second largest emancipation in the history of the U.S. for enslaved Africans, and the effects it had on the indigenous peoples of the Americas, whether it be the defeat of Tecumseh or the uh, Indian Removal Act or both. And again, I cannot stress that enough that th those are the two most important takeaways, what happened to the, the indigenous peoples of the Americas and what happened to the enslaved Africans and what allowed them to escape to their freedom. So with that, I'm going to end the video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to see me cover any other subjects in the future, 
uh, feel free to you know, leave a comment in the comment section and remember to like, share, and subscribe.